Now I'd like to introduce attorney Jack Humphrey. Did see here? Oh, sorry, Jack, I didn't even see you there. <laughs> Who is going to um, present our guest of honor today? sing these remarks, uh, but after hearing the Law Day singers, I've decided not to do that. Um, when uh, President Eisenhower uh, uh, entered his proclamation uh, declaring May 1st of each year to be Law Day, uh, it started a series of uh, celebrations uh, for the purpose of uh, promoting a better understanding of the rule of law. Uh, in this democracy of encouraging a greater respect for law and the courts and for stimulating a sense of civic responsibility and uh, good government in our community. Uh, the Lycoming Law Association has seen fit on this law day, uh, May 1st of 2007, uh, to recognize and to honor uh, an individual who uh, over a legal career spanning almost 70 years, has demonstrated and exemplified uh, those very important principles which this day is uh, intended to celebrate. Uh, after graduating from the Harvard Law School, uh, Malcolm Muir uh, began the private practice of law in Lycoming County in 1938, and in his private practice, which spanned the next 32 years with a three-year uh, uh, interim of service in the United States Navy as uh, an officer on a, a troop ship, uh, the Booker T. Washington. Um, over those 32 years, uh, Malcolm Muir became one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent, lawyer practicing in central Pennsylvania in the areas of tax and estates. Um, he was known as uh, a person who worked hard and worked long hours on behalf of his clients. Uh, he spent much uh, of his uh, time uh, in private practice living with his family in Muncie, Pennsylvania. And I recall that when I was looking for a place to to live, to buy, he, he encouraged me strongly to live east of Williamsport, uh, explaining that if you did so, uh, you never had to drive with the sun in your eyes, that <laughs> <laughs> when you left for work in the morning, the rising sun would be at your back, and when you came home in the <laughs> evening, the setting sun would likewise be at your back. Now, this might imply that he worked less hours during the winter than the summer, but I don't believe that. Um, Malcolm Muir was an important member of, of this organization, the Lycoming Law Association, and served as its president in 1954. Uh, perhaps his most important contribution, however, was uh, starting the Lycoming Law Reporter. Um, in 1946, or as of 1946, there was no method by which decisions of the, of the Court of Common Pleas of Lycoming County were gathered together in one spot, and nobody really knew what the court had done in previous years unless someone happened to remember something. Uh, sensing this um, problem, uh, Malcolm Muir began taking decisions of the court, putting headnotes on them, mimographing mimeographing these decisions and making them available to the lawyers in Lycoming County. A few years later, uh, this practice uh, evolved into the printing of the Lycoming Reporter, uh, the taking of advertisements and legal notices, and uh, the uh, uh, charging of, of uh, uh, ch charges for the publishing of those advertisements. The importance of this to the Lycoming Law Association is that today the Lycoming Law Reporter is uh, by far the most important source of income uh, to fund the very important work of the Lycoming Law Association. And Judge Muir not only founded this uh, reporter but served as its editor for 20 years. Uh, Malcolm Muir was also uh, very active in the Pennsylvania Bar Association. 
He served on its Board of Governors for a number of years. In 1965, was one of the founders of the Pennsylvania Bar Institute, which is the continuing legal a education arm of the Pennsylvania Bar Association. And in 1970, uh, was elevated to the position of president-elect of the Pennsylvania Bar Association, which meant that in the following spring, 1971, he was scheduled to become president of the Bar Association, uh, which covers all of the attorneys of Pennsylvania. Uh, he never quite made uh, the presidency of the Pennsylvania Bar Association because uh, in late 1970, he was appointed by President Nixon to become United States District Court Judge for the Middle District of Pennsylvania and is sworn in as uh, United States District Judge on November 6th of 1970. Uh, he has served in that capacity uh, since that time. Uh, Judge Muir, at the current age of uh, 92, uh, at least as of last year, was, uh, we were told, was the seventh oldest judge, uh, United States District Judge in the country. Um, I expect that by this time he's moved up the ladder a, a touch. <laughs> Uh, no one really thinks that Judge Muir is ever going to retire. Uh, my uh, law partner, Cliff Readers, and I uh, had the privilege of serving as his law, clerk in law clerks in the early 70s. And, and after we had decided to stay in this area and practice law here, Judge Muir approached us and said, when I lose it, you know, when I become senile, you guys are charged with letting me know so I can step down. Uh, I had been tempted on a few occasions. <laughs> uh, when he uh, rendered decisions that were against me or my client, but um, uh, that wouldn't have been right. And I don't think that uh, this will ever come to pass. I think it's much more likely that Judge Muir <laughs> will be approaching me <laughs> at some point and say that my time as a private attorney is over. Um, Judge Muir is uh, currently is a senior judge in the, uh, in the United States uh, District Court for the Middle District of Pennsylvania. Most senior judges sort of take it easy and uh, are assigned 25% uh, caseload or 50% caseload. Judge Muir has a 70% caseload, uh, is an extremely active uh, judge, and uh, I'm sure would prefer to up that percentage to uh, a full 100% if he could. Uh, as far as I understand it, his favorite part of being a judge is uh, presiding over trials. And if he has any complaints about the position, it's probably that there aren't as many trials uh, now as there used to be. Uh, in any event, he has uh, several interesting qualities or attributes as a trial judge, um, punctuality being one. Um, he's uh, often been quoted as saying, if you're punctual, no one's time is wasted. And when he says, court starts at 10 a.m., that means as his grandfather clock is chiming 10, the door to his chambers is opening and he is proceeding to the bench and court begins. Um, he is known for timing uh, virtually every aspect of the trial, including the uh, attorney's opening and closing statements. And when he tells you that you have 30 minutes to give an opening statement, you know that when his stopwatch hits the 30-minute mark, the argument is over. Um, he has the uncanny ability to take any date that you give him, and he will tell you what day of the week that day fell upon um, using some formula in his head uh, that I have yet to understand. <laughs> and um, he also is known as someone who pays great respect for and has, has great deference uh, to the individuals who serve on juries in cases before him. Uh, he's uh, very considerate of their time. He does not want to waste their time. And he makes every effort he can to make their experience uh, as a juror, a very important experience, a meaningful one. And I have never spoken with a jury, juror who has served on one of his uh, juries who hasn't said, that uh, it was a wonderful experience and one that they would be happy to do again. Um, 
these endearing qualities, I guess most attorneys would call them endearing, I'm sure uh, a few wouldn't, but these endearing qualities of, of Judge Muir are not necessarily his most enduring achievements as, uh, as a judge. Um, I think that, that that description would best be applied to uh, two areas that he has really sort of pioneered uh, uh, in uh, federal practice. Um, today, uh, alternative dispute resolution is a popular subject, and uh, we have all sorts of mediation procedures and others uh, in which are for the purpose of attempting to resolve cases before they actually have to come to trial. Judge Muir uh, instituted an alternative, alternative dispute resolution technique early in his tenure as judge called the summary jury trials in which shortly before the actual trial of a case, he encouraged lawyers to agree to submit their cases, to present their cases in an hour or two uh, to a specially selected jury who would hear both sides and who would then uh, retire and render a non-binding verdict on the case as presented to them, the whole process taking uh, less than a day. Uh, this was uh, very helpful to attorneys in that it encouraged them to organize their case, to streamline their case, so in fact they could present it to the jury, uh, summary jury, in, in a short time. And it was also very effective in resolving cases before uh, they went to trial because once you heard what the summary jury said, um, uh, you had a pretty good idea what was going to happen if you went to a real trial. Um, the vast majority of the cases that went to summary jury trial settled, settled uh, and I use the term vast majority, uh, it's not a, the type of term that Judge Muir would use, he would say 82.61% of them settled. <laughs> and of the few cases that didn't settle and actually went to trial, most of them, uh, i.e. 83.33% of them, uh, the verdict of the real jury was the same as, or virtually the same as, uh, the jury rendered by the uh, summary jury. The second area where uh, Judge Muir was an innovator was uh, in the use of his, or the in institution of his practice order and his trial scheduling. Uh, shortly after he took the bench, he began issuing in all cases filed before him a multi-page practice order which set forth in minute detail how this case was to proceed. The rules that had to be followed in the pretrial procedures, in the motions, in the briefings, in the pretrial conferences, and in the actual trial itself. Um, I'm not sure how many pages it was, but it, it seemed to get longer every year. And uh, this was a very new uh, experience for most attorneys. Um, as new was the fact that once a case was filed, it was immediately placed on a trial uh, term or given a trial date for some time in the future. And I recall in the early days that was as soon as six months after a case was trialed. Now, this was a very revolutionary uh, practice of, of having these, these rules and having this uh, set trial date uh, so shortly after the filing of a case. Uh, up to that point, um, things were much more casual. Uh, it was sort of like the, uh, going to trial was sort of like the Fannie and the Susquehanna. You know, it was a slow float down, a, down the Susquehanna in the summertime, uh, never quite sure when you're going to reach the end or how you're going to get there. Uh, once uh, Judge Muir uh, started his practice uh, orders and his scheduling, uh, the journey to trial was more like going over Niagara Falls in the inner two. <laughs> the end was certain and it was going to come real quick. <laughs> the importance of this practice order and the scheduling uh, reforms that uh, Judge Muir instituted is that that ultimately evolved into what we now have in the federal court system as a very detailed set of local rules which uh, ha bear uncanny resemblance to Judge Muir's uh, initial practice orders in terms of, of what they require and, and what they say. Uh, and in fact, that uh, 
um, practice of, of having more detailed rules and, in fact, scheduling cases uh, at or near the time, scheduling for trial cases at or near the time they uh, are filed are practices now that are carried on in most jurisdictions, in, including uh, uh, Lycoming County. And I think that, that Judge Muir, if he wasn't responsible for all that, he certainly uh, demonstrated uh, the worth of those practices, and uh, I think that that is uh, an enduring achievement on his part. I could go on for quite a while. Uh, I have previously, um, and tell you uh, lots of funny stories, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, Judge Muir, I'm sure, has me on his stopwatch right now. Uh, he probably would have cut me off if I wasn't talking about him. Um, but in any event, uh, uh, suffice to say, uh, uh, the Honorable Malcolm Muir uh, is, uh, we believe, probably the most uh, influential uh, member of our organization, the Lycoming Law Association, uh, and he is someone that we all uh, deeply admire uh, and have great respect for, and it's been an honor for anyone who's come in contact with him, either as an attorney or as a um, an individual uh, pursuing a case before him. It's been our honor to, to uh, have him um, um, work with us and preside over our cases. Um, and thus, the Lycoming Law Association would like to present uh, the Honorable Malcolm Muir with uh, um, a small token of their appreciation and respect. And this is a plaque, I just will read it. It says, presented in recognition to the Honorable Malcolm Muir for your exemplary leadership and selfless acts of time and dedication. Your attention to detail and outstanding work ethic have served as examples to all members of this organization and have inspired us to continue providing service to the legal community and the citizens of Lycoming County. Awarded on Law Day this first day of May 2007. This is a memorable event for me. I never expected to be honored by this association on Law Day. I enjoyed Mr. Humphrey's remarks, and I look forward to his next day in court. <laughs> Thank you, Judge.